Hello and welcome to Capitol Hill. I'm Lyndall Curtis. Having had its agreement with independent Andrew Wilkie ripped up over the issue of poker machine reform earlier this year, the government's gone some way to winning Mr Wilkie back over, on that issue at least. It's made changes to the reform legislation that he's backing, but it's not guaranteed of getting those changes through the Parliament. The Parliament today, the House of Representatives, has been debating Craig Thompson's statement to it yesterday. Rob Oakeshott, another independent, has foreshadowed a censure motion, but the debate has been about broader issues as well. Joining me to discuss the day are Liberal MP Ken Wyatt and Labor Parliamentary Secretary Sid Sidebottom. Welcome to you both. Thank you. If we could start with the issue of poker machine reform, the government's made a couple of changes to its legislation that mandatory pre-commitment would be possible at the flick of a switch and that the trial and the ACT would be independent and take into account what happens just across the border. Mr Wilkie says the reforms are not what he wanted, but it's the best thing on the table right now. Ken, is something better than nothing? Well, let me say this. I, the proposition has some merit, but I think we've got to go to the crux of the issue, which is about people's gambling addiction. Educative and awareness programs are absolutely necessary and important. And it comes to another point of how closer do we become to managing every facet of a person's life? is the flip side to this that does concern me and worry me is the access to internet gambling. It's easy to sit in your front lounge room with a warm fire and then sit down and place a series of bets or to gamble. And the, surreal the surrealness of that is the fact that you can get caught up in the figures don't mean a great deal until you get an account and then reality hits. Could you make the same argument though with, with actions by governments over the years on something like smoking where they where governments have raised the prices of cigarettes, governments control where you can and cannot smoke, it's banned in, in some places in restaurants and public spaces but in the end governments don't ban it altogether. So, so governments go some way to regulating the behaviour but without dealing with every circumstance. I think both of them are different context to consider. One has got a health implication which costs governments ultimately, both state, territory and the uh, Commonwealth government. So in one sense you can look at what the consequences are and certainly plan measures that will prevent the onset of some of the chronic conditions that come out of smoking and certainly draw down very heavily on the healthcare system when we have so many other illnesses that people need to be placed in hospital for. You've got elective surgery wedding lists that are growing. So in that context, I think that is a different argument. On this one, it goes to an addiction. Certainly when you go into the RSL clubs, and I lived in New South Wales for four and a half years, the sound of those machines are uh, like drawing you to a honeypot. And you work on the basis that you hope to beat the machine, but the machine is calculated against you. Sid, is there anything you can say to convince Ken that your legislation is worthy of support? Well, only that um, I think that uh, in actual fact Ken's last statements about the addiction uh, of gambling is that we know it is harmful for many, many people. So it's that question of, of trying to create a balance between regulation uh, and freedom of choice. And what we're seeking to do is place limits, for instance, on the amount of money you can take from an ATM at one of the establishments and also to have this uh, mandatory pre-commitment technology uh, on the machines. So people will still have choice. What uh, we're trying to say is, well, we're trying to balance that uh, with also the ability with the use of technology uh, in those environments where people we know are uh, and many of them are addicted to gambling where we can actually put in some regulatory control. Uh, they'll still have choice, but at the same time, that choice is really saying to them, if you're addictive, then, you know, uh, there's going to be regulation there. So will it affect behaviour? Well, that's what the trial is all about. Um, so it's got that dual edge side to it of there's still choice, there's limitation to how much can be withdrawn from those premises in terms of ATM and also it has that um, mandatory um, precondition on the machine itself. So we'll see what happens with the trial. 
you, you are, though, not yet guaranteed of getting your legislation through Parliament. The Greens at this stage aren't supporting it, neither is the independent Senator Nick Xenophon. Are you going to have to do some more negotiation to make sure that your legislation will pass Parliament? Well, we live by negotiation. Uh, that's, uh, that's how this Parliament operates, and in many ways that's a good, a good thing, I believe, uh, because you can get lots of legislation through, through negotiation as we have. I think in this instance, um, you know, and it's a question you, you put to Ken, and Ken was uh, were trying to answer as well, is, you know, is, is something better than nothing? Uh, and once you go down the track of reform and trial it, then to me that sounds sensible. So I think the Greens and, and Senator Xenophon are really going to have to ask themselves that question ultimately. But negotiations will continue and I think the Australian uh, community wants some form of regulation, as we have with so many other things, that cause harm. Can, so can you, can you, you, I think one of the things we've got to seriously think about is when we see the legislation is since point about the restriction within the club that you go to doesn't prevent me from going outside or and again accessing an ATM and getting an additional amount or coming in with a pocket full of money. So the legislation will need to be very explicit around a number of things before uh, you could consider it that, at the fact that it might be successful. Now technology as new machines come on stream uh, is probably a better way to go if you're going to go down this path. But the nanny state element still remains in the back of my thoughts in terms of the impact of when do we continue to take away choices from people in this country when we talk well, about a democracy. Although in your, your home state of Western Australia, people don't have the option of going to clubs to use poker machines that they do have in, in states like New South Wales and Queensland because poker machines aren't in the clubs, are they? No, because they're in the uh, Burswood Casino. So people go to that point. There's a combination of entertainment, meals and uh, the poker machines. But again, uh, it's in a context where there are some people who have addictions and so they escape through that loophole. Although most gaming places have some form of uh, support for those who seek it. But the trouble is if they don't choose to seek it, then uh, that's where they slip through that gap. Uh, Sid, the, the legislation, uh, as Ken says, deals with poker machines. Does more need to be done to deal with online gambling, the things that people can access sitting at home in their living room where they don't need to have the bother of, of yeah. leaving their house to do it. Oh, look, I, I think what Ken's saying is absolutely right. I mean, th this is a whole new universe mm. out there, the cyber universe, and, uh, and uh, just catching up with it is, is the most difficult thing. Now, uh, there will be ways and means, I assume, through technology and other developments that uh, we can have a look at this, but uh, look, it's a Pandora's box. Uh, what we're talking about, I suppose, is a is a physical location, a practical solution. Um, as uh, Ken was saying, there are difficulties with it, but the the issue is it's like smoking. You can ban smoking, but it can't stop people from smoking at home. Mm. Right. So choices are there, and we as a community uh, make decisions that sometimes will regulate, sometimes we won't. We've got to try and get a balance. But the whole cyber issue uh, is another matter, and that's very difficult. If we can move on now to to the issue of Craig Thompson, the position today moved to have his statement to Parliament considered by the Privileges Committee. There's been a debate in Parliament this afternoon over um, a, a broader issue to do uh, with Mr Thompson, but also the question of a code of conduct. Ralph Boakshots raised the possibility he might move a censure motion over the time it took Mr Thompson to address Parliament. Ken, do you think the Parliament should be taking some action on this or should look at something broader like a Code of Conduct or an Integrity Commission or an Ethics Commissioner? Look, I think there's a couple of things. All of us, there is an expectation for every parliamentarian to behave with a, uh, a standard of moral ethics. And in the representation of the constituents we have, then there is an expectation again uh, that we hold a place of integrity, but we are honest in that process. The sad part in all of this is when somebody appears and the allegations are there to have done the wrong thing, then it would be better to deal with those matters. Certainly uh, that speech delivered yesterday didn't answer all the questions and should have really have been delivered much earlier. Uh, and some of the debates that will occur around uh, the, the motions that are there 
will still come back to that issue of integrity. And people don't forgive us when we err on the wrong side of their expectation of the behaviours of members of parliament. Uh, Sid, Harry Jenkins, the, the former speaker, in, in his speech this afternoon talked about uh, integrity commissions and ethics commissions in other countries saying they take the politics out of it. Is, is this a case that could have gone to a body like that, particularly as he also pointed out that it's dealing with conduct before Mr Thompson became an MP? Well, indeed. Um, I, I think uh, this, this is a sad occasion for us all because we were just Ken and I were just saying that, you know, uh, what affects one of our colleagues affects us all. And the standing of the parliament is absolutely crucial. And um, I think the, and I think we're moving without putting words in other people's uh, mouths or thoughts. But um, I think we're moving towards a, a codified um, code of conduct, um, and uh, you know, with an ethics commission, I suppose. The, the more you can take the politics out of it, and the quicker. Uh, and more speedier that we can resolve some of these issues the better because I think one of the issues we've got here is that this has been long lingering uh, prior to uh, the member for Dobell coming into Parliament and then at the same time it's taken four years uh, for an investigation to take place and in the meantime we've had other investigations taking place as well but I, I would like to say amongst all of this um, every member of Parliament like every citizen has the right to the presumption of innocence and I think it's really, really important what we're saying and doing now maintains that principle uh, and absolutely uh, reinforces it. And but that's does, what I'm worried about. But doesn't that raise a, a question, as the opposition has raised, if you're um, sticking to the presumption of innocence, why was Mr Thompson suspended from the Labor Party and suspended from the caucus? Well, I, I think uh, the Prime Minister uh, has made it uh, clear that the Prime Minister felt that a combination of circumstances were at play where the, um, the standing of the Parliament was being affected by the coverage uh, that was being, uh, and, and it has been, um, a quite massive, uh, and in fact um, quite uh, frenetic and frantic at times. So the Prime Minister has made that decision. And at the same time as the member himself made that decision to stand aside from the Labor caucus. But it's the time that, uh, that this whole procedure has been going on is of concern and it's affecting um, the standing of the parliament in the eyes of the public. Ken, Ken is the opposition uh, worried? Are you concerned about setting precedents in your response to this situation that you may have to live up to in the future? Look, I, I think if we look back over the history of parliament, there have been a number of occasions when oppositions have taken a particular stance in respect to a member and a couple of the key players in responding on behalf of government, they, they themselves were the protagonists of doing something very similar, of questioning the behaviour of a minister or of a, a member of government. But if we assume that principle of innocence, then in one sense I'm very critical of the Prime Minister having set uh, the member for Dobell aside out of caucus because if you argue a principle that relates to the parliament then both sides have to apply that principle within their own party structures as well. And that's all I have to leave it since so I bottom and Ken Wyatt. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, thank you, Lyndall. Thanks, Ken. And thank you for joining Capitol Hill. Please be with us at the same time tomorrow.